Hi, I'm Mike Portnoy. Welcome to my video, Progressive Drum Concepts. Um, for the next 60 minutes or so, I'm going to spend some time playing and uh, lots of time talking about different concepts and theories and stuff that, that I uh, incorporate into my playing, um, both solo and with Dream Theater. Um, I'm also going to be joined uh, sporadically throughout the video by two members of Dream Theater, uh, my bass player John Myung and my keyboard player Derek Sherinian. And they're going to help me uh, play some parts of Dream Theater songs that I'm going to break down and uh, describe and show how I came up with those parts. But uh, I'd like to start with a, a, a few things um, which are pretty basic but I'll show you what I'm using up here. Um, obviously I'm surrounded by um, a very big selection of drums and cymbals and um, first of all it looks very cool <laughs> but uh, you know I get the stuff thankfully for free and so I think I, I try to take advantage as much as I can to try incorporating as many different sounds and sizes and stuff into my kit. Um, obviously the drums are set up I have um, well actually I think there there is a, a diagram included in the booklet so you could really see specifically what I'm using, but I'd like to maybe describe why I use what I use. Um, I set everything up with, a, with almost like a mirror image sort of um, concept, whereas everything is accessible from both sides. Uh, right up front I have two 18-inch crashes, uh, a 16 and a 17-inch crash, uh, an 18 and a 20 china. So I have chinas and crashes on both sides. I have a, a set of 14-inch hi-hats on my left, which which I can control with my pedal. And then over here, I've got an open set of 13 hats and a closed set of 12. So, and, and splashes. I have splashes, uh, an eight and a 10, a six and a 12. So no matter where I am on the kit, I have options, similar options on both sides. If I'm facing to the left, I have hi-hats, splashes, crashes, and chinas. If I'm facing on the right, I have hi-hats, splashes, crashes, chinas. You get the idea. So I set it up so everything is very, um, uh, very ambidextrous, and because I, I like switching things up and playing patterns not only with my right hand but playing with my left hand and, and doing stuff like that. So this really makes the setup perfect because no matter where I am on the kit, there's always something to hit, and I could always create a beat, and it just gives me a lot of options when creating these beats. So, uh, this past year, 1995, I, I started really getting into doing a lot of drum clinics and it's been very helpful for me because it's really helped me analyze my playing again. And uh, some of the stuff I'd like to cover in this video are, are things that I most commonly get asked at these clinics. And the first of which is what I'd like to start off with right now, which is double bass technique. Now, um, there's sort of uh, two applications of double bass that I'd like to cover. The first would be um, how double bass is used within grooves and stuff, and then later on I'd like to get into how I use my double bass in fills and stuff like that. So I'm going to start with um, the most basic of double bass technique when used in the context of a groove. Uh, when I first started playing double bass, um, I, I, I was really into a lot of the, this was like the early 80s and I was listening to drummers like Tommy Lee and, and Tommy Aldridge and stuff like that and, uh, and they were the ones that were really using the double bass in, within the grooves and, and the context of, of songs. So I started out just learning the basic, you know, eighth note, sixteenth note, triplet patterns and stuff like that and um, I would play double bass to everything, no matter what it was, I would just listen to the radio and even if I'm in the car or whatever, you know, my feet were always going just to, to get the coordination and, and, you know, have them even and everything like that, just to get all of that down. So uh, some of the exercises I did, I'd like to share with you right now. First of all, I'd like to say that it's very, very important when uh, starting to play double bass to play with a metronome. Uh, it's very important. It's something that I did when I first started playing. Uh, or play along with other records because they've usually recorded with click tracks and their time is usually pretty steady. But play along with that just because a lot of people when they start playing double bass they'll, they'll rush or they'll drag or whatever. So play with the metronome and also it's also really important to start very slow 
and build your way up on the metronome. And you know, a lot of drummers just get behind the kit and they want to play Slayer, you know, <laughs> you know. But it's real important to just start with the basics, just like a taka 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 taka, you know, something very slow, and let it build up. It's like that old expression: you have to learn to walk before you can run. So, let me show you some of the, the exercises that I did when I first started with double bass. Okay, so I'm going to play the metronome and concentrate on my main kick being completely locked in with the metronome and the downbeats and the quarter notes. And I'm going to start with quarter notes, then my main kick is going to start doing eighth notes, and then I'm going to add in my left kick on all the upbeats. And every once in a while, I'm going to pull out my left kick to show you that it's very important to keep that right foot locked in with the metronome. So here we go. So the, the, the key there is making sure that right foot is always locked in. And start slow and slowly build it up. And then before you know it, you could be, pl be playing all your favorite Metallica songs. <laughs> um, now, this is, uh, this is the basic technique when it comes to 16th notes. Uh, basically, you're just leading with your right, and you're, feeling, you're always feeling your right on the pulse, your right foot. But when you start playing triplets and patterns of triplets, that's when it is a completely another theory entirely. Um, when you're playing triplets, you're no longer always leading with the right because you're playing patterns of three. One, two, three, two, two, three. One, two, three, two, two, three. And the way I play, alternating back and forth, you're actually going right, left, right, and then left, right, left. So your lead foot is alternating every pattern of three. So for instance, alternating back and forth. So that's a little tricky because it's different than locking in on just feeling your right foot being locked in. So one trick that I do, when I first started learning the triplet patterns, uh, it was a little awkward for my left to be leading every other, every other um, set of triplets. So what I would do is break down the two sets of three, one, two, three, four, five, six. Rather than looking at it, like two sets of three, I would actually look at it like three sets of two. So instead of one, two, three, four, five, six, I would look at it like one, two, three, four, and five, six. And that way, my right foot was now leading again. It was going, instead of going one, two, three, four, five, six, one, two, three, four, five, six, it's going one, two, three, four, five, six, one, two, three, four, five, six, the one, the three, and the five. So let me give you an example. I'm going to uh, play the ride starting off with the one and the four, one, two, three, four, five, six, one, two, three, four, five, six. Then I'm going to show how it sounds when you're accenting every other beat, the one, the three, and the five. So here we go. So that's uh, one way of helping getting that triplet feel down. Um, one exercise I used to do to be able to combine these two different kinds of grooves, you have the 16th note grooves and you have the triplet grooves. One thing I used to do is play alternating patterns on top where my feet are just constant and steady, just going duka, 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 back and forth. But on top, I'm alternating between eighth note feels, triplet feels, 16th note feels, upbeats, downbeats. And that's one way to get comfortable with the adjustments between all of the different grooves. So I'll play an example of what I'm talking about.
there's, there you could see um, my feet were just doing one thing and on top I'm alternating between all these different kinds of grooves. Okay, so there's a couple of examples of how to play grooves with double bass. Um, another aspect of double bass, like I mentioned earlier, is using them in fills and uh, it's something that I do an awful lot. And um, I'm going to show a, a couple of ways that I use uh, double bass and toms and, and snare stuff all combined to make up some really cool fills and uh, stuff that I use all the time, both in songs and solos. So I'm going to start off um, showing some patterns um, right here where I'm doing two on top and two on bottom. So like a da da ba bum da da ba bum So uh, this is one of the ways of doing it. You start with, the, you know, right, I do right-left patterns. So right-left with the hands and right-left with the feet, two and two. Now, that's two and two. Um, another thing that I use a lot is four on top and two on the bottom, like this. Did a couple different combinations in there. And then um, you could try six on top and two on the bottom, like this. Then, uh, you, I mean, you could try all different combinations of this kind of stuff. And this is what I do a lot in my solos, just uh, different combinations where the feet are doing two and different twos, fours, sixes, different combinations on top. You could even uh, do two on top, four on the bottom, like a... Okay, right now I'd like to... Um, break down a fill that I do in the song Pull Me Under, which is something that a lot of drummers have asked me what is going on. So I'm going to show you. <laughs> it's using uh, a lot of these kind of patterns, you know, um, twos, fours, and sixes on top with twos on the, with the, twos on the bottom. And uh, what I had was this is the fill um, going into the last chorus of Pull Me Under. And uh, I wanted to have this real explosive 30-second note fill. And, um, you know, the tempo is like this. So a 32nd note, a 16th note would be... So a 32nd note would be double that, like... So I wanted to do this real quick 32nd note fill. And um, rather than doing it on the snare drum and having some sort of, like, 60s wipeout, you know, kind of vibe like a... I wanted to do something like that, but really open it up and spread it out between the feet and the toms and stuff. So the pattern I did was a set of two and two, six and two, and two and two for the first, for the first bar, like this. That's the first bar. And if you add all of that up, you obviously get a set of 16th notes. You know, 2 and 2 is 4, 6 and 2 is 8, 8 and 4 is 12. That leaves you 4, so you do another 2 and 2. But I'll get more into mathematics later. Anyway, the second half um, is something similar to that, but it's uh, 4 on top, 2 on the bottom, 4 on top, 2 on the bottom, and then 2 and 2. So the second half sounds like this. So if you put them together, this is what you get. Now a 
I'll start to play it a little faster and bring it up to speed. So, there you have it. One cool way of using double bass in a fill. Okay, the next thing I'd like to talk about is something that plays a very big role in my playing, as well as the music of Dream Theater, and that's odd time signatures, or even just odd approaches to common time signatures. Um, the thing with odd time signatures is, and to me this is the same concept that I use in, in all of drumming and, and rhythm uh, in general, is it all comes down to numbers and counting and arithmetic and stuff like that and that's always the approach I've had with coming up with my drum parts you know I try to try to always look at at the numbers and try to think of different ways to combine different numbers to reach you know to reach a an end or whatever the first thing I'd like to talk about is odd time signatures and to me I've always had the approach where I, I don't see why it's any easier to play four beats per measure than it is to play five beats or seven beats. It's, it's all a matter of counting and doing the arithmetic. And um, that's an approach I've always had when I'm coming up with my parts, and I'd like to share some of these theories with you. Um, playing four is obviously you have four beats per measure, but you could break that down to eight eighth notes per measure or even 16 sixteenth notes if you really want to get, um, you know, particular. So uh, when, when you're playing a bar of four, you're counting one, two, three, four. So obviously, if you're going to play a bar of five, four, it's the same thing as four, four, except you're adding an extra quarter note. So you would count it one, two, three, four, five. And the same goes for seven or nine or any, any, it's all combinations of numbers. And in fact, they all break down to twos and threes. So everything could be broken down into those common denominators. So first, let's, let's look at 5-4. Uh, like I said, it's basically, there's, there's a couple ways you could look at it, but one would be playing it the same as a bar of 4 and adding an extra quarter note. So I'm going to play a bar of 4 and then play a bar of 5, and you can hear how it's just one extra quarter note. Here's the bar of 4. Easy, right? <laughs> so now you just add an extra quarter note and you'll have one, two, three, four, five. Now, there's a couple of different ways of looking at it. Uh, you could also look at a bar of five as a two and a three, or a three and a two, or any combinations like that. Now, seven, four is the same theory, um, but there's a couple of different ways to play it. Um, you could play it as a bar of four and a bar of three. You know, one, two, three, four, one, two, three. Or you could do three and four. One, two, three, one, two, three, four. It's all numbers. So um, I'll play a bar of seven, four, so you can feel what a basic bar of seven, four feels like. If you count that, it's one, two, three, four, one, two, three, bump. Now, one thing, uh, it starts to get a little trickier. I mean, that's all pretty easy, but it starts to get a little trickier when you start dealing with eighth notes, uh, bars of seven, eight, five, eight, nine, eight. And what you're basically doing is subdividing the beats into twice the value, eighth notes, and you're counting them twice as fast. Um, for instance, a bar of seven, eight, would be counted the same way, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. But one trick with, with seven, for instance, um, seven is the only number from one to ten where there's actually two syllables. You know, it's seven. So a lot of mistakes, uh, a lot of times people make the mistake of counting a bar of seven, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Well, that's not right. You gotta, what I, one trick I've always done is just count sev. One, two, three, four, five, six, sev. One, two, three, four, five, six, sev. Because if you say seven, a lot of people 
treat the VIN as an extra beat and you're actually playing a bar of four or eight eight, which is the same thing. So that's some of the theories with, with the odd time signatures and that's the general concept behind them. Like I said, it, it's all a matter of arithmetic and just counting. I mean, that's very, very important when playing odd time signatures, odd time signatures is counting and count out loud so you become comfortable with the grooves. Now what I'd like to do is show some ways to combine some odd time signatures and uh, come up with creative beats and stuff using them. For instance, um, most people if they were handed a piece of music or, or um, somebody came in with a progression that was 16 beats long, the um, the, the first instinctive thing to do for a drummer is to play four bars of 4-4 four, four within those 16 beats. Well, I always like to look at music in terms of numbers and think of, okay, how can I get to 16 beats? I don't, you know, everybody plays four bars of four. So I'll think, okay, how do I get to 16? You could play two bars of 5-4, which give you a total of 10, and then maybe two bars of 3-4, which gives you six. So 10 and six, you have your 16. Or you could try breaking it up into different combinations, maybe a bar of 7-4, and then a bar of 5-4, which gives you 12, and then maybe a bar of 4-4. Four, four. So what I'm going to do right here is show you uh, some of these examples and play along to um, a drum machine, which is programmed into 16 beats, broken up into four, four bars of four. So you can hear a crash on the top of each bar going one, two, three, four, two, two, three, four, three, two, three, four, four, two, three, four. And then on the one of, of every 16 beats, you're going to hear a whistle. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to play two bars, uh, two sets of four bars of four. Then I'm going to play two sets broken up into the first example, which I said, 5-4, 5-4, 3-4, 3-4, 3-4, two sets of that, and then two sets of the second example, which I gave, which was a bar of 7-4, a bar of 5-4, and a bar of 4-4. So here we go. Okay, now I'm going to get a, a little help from my friends here, and uh, John and Derek are going to play along with me, and I'm going to uh, play through a couple of Dream Theater songs and show examples of uh, not only how I played my, my parts, but how I came up with these parts. And uh, we're going to show some songs that use odd time signatures so you can get some ideas of different feels and stuff and different applications for odd time signatures. So we're going to start off with um, a song from the Awake album called Voices which is uh, the opening riff that we're going to play through is in 9-8. And uh, the way that I phrase the 9-8 here is taking a bar of 4-4, four, four, which is the equivalent of 8-8, eight, eight, and adding an extra eighth note. So instead of 1, 2, 3, 4, 1, 2, 3, 4, you're going to add an extra eighth note. So it's actually going to be counted 1, 2, 3, 4, 1, 1, 2, 3, 4, 1, 1. So that's the idea here. So uh, I'm going to sh basically the first part of, of, this, uh, of this beat is just outlining that kind of groove, just counting a 9-8 in, in that kind of phrasing. So here it is. OK, now I'm going to take that basic beat and add the splashes onto the upbeats. So it's going to be almost the same exact thing, but adding the splashes onto the upbeats. So here it is. Uh, 
Um, now, this next example is um, sort of giving the 9-8 feel like a halftime groove. And actually, uh, so the phrasing is going to be a little bit different. It's going to have a halftime feel. And I'm, I'm doing some double bass stuff, and I'm on the china. So here, here it is. And this last example from Voices is taking um, basically the same groove from the beginning and I'm playing um, on, on the mini china, I'm actually playing one bar of 9-4 on top of two bars of 9-8. So it's kind of strange. My kick and snare is alternating two bars of 9-8. And on top, I'm doing a bar 9-4 uh, with the mini china. So actually, the first bar of 9-8 you're, the mini china is falling on the downbeats, and then the second bar of 9-8, being that this is still steady and constant, it's actually on the upbeats. So it's turning around every other bar. So here is that example. Okay, the next song I'd like to uh, break apart and show you some examples from is uh, from the uh, Images and Words album. This is from Metropolis. And uh, this is the beginning of the instrumental section. And um, this song for us was a great opportunity to go nuts with odd time signatures and crazy parts. Um, but anyway, the intro is a combination of two different odd time signatures alternating back and forth. Um, it's, it's actually 6, 8, and 7, 8. So you count it 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. So that's the way it's counted. So the first example, I'm actually just playing a beat that outlines those two, al those two alternating odd time signatures. So here it is. Now the second example from Metropolis is taking uh, the, a phrase which is 6, 8, and 7, 8, and you add that up and you have 13, 8. So what I did, like I was talking about earlier, is I took the sum of 13, 8 and tried to come up with a different way to come up with that 13 while the guys were still playing in 6 and 7. So I took that 13 and broke it up into a bar of 4, 4, which is the same as 8, 8, and 5-8. So if you add up 8-8 eight, eight, and 5-8, you get 13, so it all works out the same. So here's an example where I was playing 4-4 four, four, and 5-8 to equal up to their 13. This last example from Metropolis is going back to the original feel, which is like a 6-8, 7-8 sort of thing, except I'm doing um, a lot of double, steady double bass work, and the 6-8 is more of like a 3-4 feel, which is the equivalent. So it's more of like a 3-4 and 7-8 feel, but what I'm doing is I'm playing uh, the first set of 13, you know, which it equals to, uh, like with a downbeat feel, and then the second set is an upbeat feel, so it's alternating back and forth. So there's a lot of different polyrhythms going on all at once. So here is the third example from Metropolis. Okay, this last example I'd like to give, uh, outlining odd meters, is from our latest release, A Change of Seasons. And uh, this is kind of similar to the approach I took with Metropolis, where we have something that is the sum of 15-8 uh, for the first verse of the song. So what I did is I played it broken up into two bars, the first bar being 3-4, which is equivalent to 6-8, and then the second bar is a bar of 9-8. So 6-8 and 9-8 is 15-8. Like I said, it's all arithmetic. So I'm playing a bar of 3-4, 9-8, 15-8. 
and 9-8. And like I said before, earlier, 9-8 is phrased in this way, uh, like a bar of 4-4 four, four with an extra eighth note. So here it is. Okay, now um, the second example from A Change of Seasons is the second verse where we are still playing a progression that adds up to 15-8, but once again I tried to make my part a little bit interesting and, and different from section to section, so I phrased it in a group, two groups of 6-8, giving it like a triplet feel, like a 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. So I did two bars of 6-8, which equals 12-8, and then it left me three, so I did a bar of three eight as well. So here's what we had. Now this last example, also from A Change of Seasons, is going back to the original feel, which was a 15-8 broken up into a 3-4 a and a 9-8, but it's showing another way to play something, even if it's in the same time signature, I tried to get creative and, and phrase it differently and try something completely different. So this is going back to a 3-4-9-8 feel, alternating back and forth, and a, a whole different kind of groove though. Here it is. Okay, the next thing I'd like to talk about is uh, something that I guess is the biggest responsibility of a drummer, and that is the groove. And uh, even more specifically, the phrasing within the groove. Um, like I said before, I, I've always come from the mentality where I think a drum part should be very exciting, it, it should be very musical. Um, most drummers like to, they're comfortable just playing straight two and four, I, I like to try to be as creative as possible and play the most unobvious thing that I, that I could possibly do, just to make the parts develop within a song. You know, if you have a song structure, verse, chorus, verse, chorus, you know, each of those verses, rather than playing the same thing, I like to try different things to make the parts develop and grow throughout a song. So I'm going to give a couple examples here, um, once again, with the help from John and Derek. Um, a couple more examples from Dream Theater songs where I made the parts grow and develop and tried stuff that was a little bit more interesting than just playing a basic 2-4 beat. Okay, the, the first example uh, is going to be from uh, our song Surrounded. Um, this also actually ties in with some of the odd time signatures I was talking about earlier because uh, the main riff in Surrounded is in 9 uh, nine four, but actually what it really is is bars of four four and five four alternating back and forth, and and just continued on. So um, uh, what we had is this main riff that was in nine or four and five, and uh, it kept reoccurring. So I wanted to try phrasing my parts different, and doing different grooves each time it came up. So I'm going to show five different ways that I played different grooves and phrasings to the same thing. The first example from the, is the beginning of the song when, when the, uh, the part first kicks in. And I'm actually playing um, a laid back halftime feel with, um, actually on the album I used a wood block, but on my new kit live I used one of the octobons. And it's more of a laid back halftime feel with the octobons like on the upbeats. And uh, here it is.
Okay, this second example is the same thing. We have the 4-4 and the 5-4 going. And this is actually, once the band kicks in, this is actually what is uh, what we call the pre-verse, the first pre-verse. And we kick in, and I'm doing more of a heavy open hi-hat sort of feel between the 4 and the 5. And uh, the snare is falling on the 3 of each measure, the 4 and the 5. 1, 2, 3, 4, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 1, 2, 3, 4, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So that's the feel here. So here's uh, example number two. Okay, this third example is actually the first verse of Surrounded. And once again, the, uh, it's the same feel, the 4-4 the four, four and the 5-4 alternating back and forth. But I'm doing more of a closed hi-hat um, sort of thing, and the snare is actually falling on the 3 on the measure of 4 and on the 4 on the measure of 5. So here's what I did. Okay, this next example is actually what is the second pre-verse, uh, which was the second example I showed earlier. And it's actually played almost the same way, except uh, whereas I had it, the snare placed on the, all the threes before, now I have it on the three of the measure of four and then on the two on the measure of five. So here it is. And this last example is uh, the second verse. And um, what I did here was give the whole thing an upbeat sort of feel. And uh, I'm actually playing the snare on the two and the four of the bar of four, and then the three and the five on the bar of five. So um, if you were to actually uh, listen to it, starting from the bar of five, it sounds like a constant snare, like a steady two, four thing. But the, the, the first bar of the the first note of the bar of five sort of displaces the whole thing. So it's kind of kind of interesting. Here it is. Now I'm going to show an example of how you can uh, make something that could be very simple, very interesting, and, and it all comes down to interesting phrasing. So um, this is from Take the Time, and the third verse of the song. Um, the band had a, had a, a progression that uh, I very easily could have just played a, a straight 2-4 beat, and essentially I do with my kick and snare, but I really embellished it uh, with the toms and the cymbals and stuff. So I'll, I'm going to break it down to two sections. Um, the first section is more of like a, a jungle beat sort of uh, thing with the toms. And I'm going to play that for you now, slow and then up to speed. And uh, the kick, the kick and snare is just going doom to ga, doom to ga, doom to ga. And everything else is doing weird, syncopated, busy things. So here's where I turn something that could have been a straight 2-4 into something a little bit busier and a little bit more interesting. It starts with just the kick and snare doing this. And then I add in this. So the kick and snare is just doing a, a straight 2-4, and I'm going to play a few slow, and then show you all the little cymbal and bell embellishments that were thrown in to make it exciting. So it starts off real slow. The, here's the kick and snare. And then I 
Add everything in. Okay, so I'm going to play these two back to back up to speed and I'll show you uh, what it turned out to be. Well, that about wraps it up. I hope you've enjoyed everything on this video. I had, I had a great time making it, and uh, hopefully I explained some things that, that you could take home and uh, incorporate into your playing, and, and, and hopefully it all made sense and, and it was informative. If not, hey. <laughs> but anyway, uh, I had a great time, and thank you very much. And keep playing, keep listening, and I'll see you soon. I'm going to finish off playing along with uh, the Dream Theater track, Aradomania. <laughs>